And good evening, Lived Black Experience community, wherever you are. And it is so good to know that uh, we have viewers all around the states and all uh, outside of the country, Mexico, the Caribbean, uh, Europe, and uh, we're very excited about that. Um, I know probably every broadcast I say, this is a very special broadcast, and uh, this is indeed uh, this evening another very special broadcast with a very special uh, presenter. Um, we want to talk about uh, this evening uh, an essay that uh, appeared in the New York Times last year. And um, in reading it, um, my body is a Confederate monument. Um, as a Black woman raised in the South, um, the, the essay really resonated with me and, and um, even took me back in reflection upon um, where my people are from, uh, Cabo Verde, where I look at those people and then I, who are Senegalese and Portuguese. And so when I see the Senegalese people in Senegal, and then I see people of Portuguese uh, descent. Um, I, I, this essay reminded me that um, it's definitely something, uh, the sins of, of slavery were happened long before we as Black people here in America arrived here on these shores as enslaved souls. So this indeed this evening is a very, I think, personal uh, topic. And I'm very excited about um, the discussion that I know is going to come out of this. Sister Kara, our resident facilitator, how are you this evening? I am wonderful, thank you. Good, good, good. Um, and I guess as there's no need to delay, let's get right in there. All right. Well, as always, welcome to everyone who is joining us this evening. We look forward to engaging in this conversation with you about the essay, My Body as a Confederate Monument. Tonight's conversation will be a community dialogue examining uh, this essay and what it means to be a Black woman in America through the lens of a Black feminist. Giving our uh, presentation this evening will be Dr. Mary Rofe. Dr. Rofe is currently an assistant professor of ethnic studies at Stanislaus State. She completed her PhD from Temple University in Applied Anthropology and is a critical scholar whose teaching and research examines social inequities in education, specifically the school to prison pipeline in relation to race, class, and gender. Dr. Rofe's scholarly interests also include women of color, feminisms, and popular culture. And she has several years of professional experience as a K through 12 teacher, coach, and as a public policy advocate in the nonprofit sector. Welcome, Dr. Rofe. Thank you so much, Kara and Bernadine. Thank you for having me here. And I wanna say welcome to everyone uh, who is tuning in. The platform is yours, Dr. Sister Mary Rofe. <laughs> Thank you, Bernardine. And um, I don't know if we can uh, project the my Google Doc slide. Excellent. Thank you. So first of all, if you haven't had an opportunity to read Caroline Randall Williams' essay, My Body is a Confederate Monument, I encourage you to do so after our time together, our dialogue in community together, our fellowship, because that's really what I felt when I read this essay. 
And more than an essay, it really resonated within me on every level from the inside out as more of a love letter, right? It was more of a, a love letter to truth. It was a love letter to the relentless and ongoing resilience of Black women in particular and all peoples who have been impacted by colonization and by enslavement. So the way that I'm going to start the conversation tonight is really gonna be as a love letter to Caroline Randall Williams, who is a poet. And uh, I am a critical, what I call a critical interdisciplinary ethnic studies scholar. And my emphasis is in black studies. And so this is a love letter to a poet from a scholar. Next slide, please. So to really ground our space together, because I believe that energy and spirit transcends time and space. So wherever we may happen to be physically logging in from, uh, I definitely believe that we have we are creating a shared space here in spirit this evening. So I wanna start out with the land acknowledgement, a labor acknowledgement, and what I call a love acknowledgement. I want to formally and with great respect acknowledge that where I currently live, Turlock, California, is located on the traditional lands of the Yokuts Nation. My campus, Stanislaus State, is built on the unceded ancestral lands of these indigenous tribes. The Murdoch Center is located on lands of the Navajo or the Diné. We honor their past, present, and future generations who have lived here for millennia and who will forever call this place home. Thank you for letting us honor them and give our thanks to their ancestors and descendants and for their constant and careful stewardship of these lands. And please feel free to silently honor the ancestors of uh, who are the stewards of the land on which you currently reside. Next slide, please. Thank you. I also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor upon which our countries our states and our institutions are built. I remember that our country is built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped and brought to the US from the African continent and recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. I also acknowledge all immigrant labor, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples who contributed to the building of the country and continue to serve within our labor force. And I also wanna give a special acknowledgement for all unpaid caregiving labor. Next slide, please. So I've added this por portion. <laughs> I warned Bernadine in advance that I was gonna do a love acknowledgement. <laughs> She's shaking her head. So um, I specifically acknowledge and speak in the spirit of Ubuntu. I am because we are. And I would not be in California. I would not be an assistant professor of ethnic studies with an emphasis in black studies, fulfilling my purpose filled work. If it had not been for being a graduate student and earning my master's degree at Northern Arizona University, and then being invited back in 2012 by Deb Harris, who said, in 2012 to apply for a faculty position in my original home department of anthropology and then also in ethnic studies. And Deb Harris was a mentor of mine when I was a graduate student from 1997 to 2000. And Deb Harris also opened the door to this opportunity as well as to her home because uh, Flagstaff, they, Flagstaff is nicknamed Poverty with the View. It's very expensive to live in Flagstaff. And so Deb opened up her home to me. She allowed me to live there for the first year of my three years at Northern Arizona University as a faculty member. And while I was there, uh, I connected with Coral Evans, who is the former, will always be the mayor of Flagstaff in my eyes, and Bernadine Lewis. And so these, this was these, this was my sister, my sister circle of love when I was in Flagstaff for those three years. And because of that experience and all of the opportunities that came with it, I was able to then uh, move on eventually to becoming an assistant professor of uh, ethnic studies with an emphasis in black studies at Stanislaus State or Stanislaus, 
a state. It's named after a Yokut warrior who really brought together members of, from a variety of Khalifa-based indigenous nations to fight uh, the Spanish conquistadores. So, and this is a picture of Bernadine and I, because, you know, part of part of uh, the work that we do is self-care, is, is love, and it's radical, right? It's, it's revolutionary to practice self-care and to really see one another. And so this is a picture of us at the Redwoods uh, when I was there as a faculty member. So this is, I, I really, uh, it's, it's so important to acknowledge uh, these three sisters and also both the anthropology departments and the ethnic study program at Northern Arizona University. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, I'm an assistant professor of ethnic studies um, with an emphasis in black studies. And what I will say is I'm so excited. I did not realize that we would have the global family here this evening because I actually have the tremendous opportunity in 2019 to participate in the Black Transnational Decolonial Feminism School that was largely created and mentored by Angela Davis in Brazil, in Bahia, right? In the, in the, south, in the northeastern part of Brazil, which is also known as Little Africa. And I was able to participate in this program and actually expand really uh, not only my sense of self, but also the frameworks for my scholarship. So my emphasis, in addition to being on equity and social justice in K through 12 and pop culture is also in black decolonial transnational feminisms. Uh, next slide, please. So what I'm doing is I'm in a sense, when I was reading Caroline Randall Williams essay, My Body is a Confederate Monument, it really already felt like a dialogue. It really already felt like a conversation. So the way that I put together what I'm gonna share with you uh, this evening is I excerpt specific quotes or passages from Caroline Randall Williams essay, and then I respond to them. Right, because what she's speaking to is she's using the specific to speak to the universal and our experiences as African descent peoples, as indigenous peoples, right, as BIPOC, as black indigenous peoples of color. So I will begin with this excerpt. I have rape colored skin. My light brown blackness is a living testament to the rules, the practices, the causes of the old South. If there are those who want to remember the legacy of the Confederacy, if they want monuments, well then, my body is a monument. My skin is a monument. Next slide, please. Thank you, yes, for So when I read this essay, and I just, I love, Poets, I love creatives, our creatives on social media, our longstanding creatives. I love the griots, right, from our oral story storytelling cultures and passing down not only the letter, but the spirit of the law in storytelling format. And so as an academic, I said, oh my gosh, Caroline Randall Williams is saying a word and a mouthful. And she's speaking to the legacy of white supremacy, of genocide, of colonization and of slavery. Because what I understand now, and it took me some time to get here, is that without colonization, without the genocide of indigenous peoples on Turtle Island and on the Western hemisphere as a whole, there would be, there would have been no massive transatlantic slave trade. The two go hand in hand. So we have colonization, we have genocide. We literally have enslaved, kidnapped Africans being forced to clear indigenous lands in order to further colonize westward expansion. So colonization and genocide go hand in hand with slavery. Could you please uh, highlight the slide again or bring it into Thank you, like zoom in, I don't have the, I'm not a techie, I'm not tech support. So this is a uh, photo of my mother and her mother 
on my mother's wedding day to my father. And so this is an ode to my grandmother and my mother. She said, when I look in the mirror, I see rape. She said, I looked for the darkest black man I could find. She wanted to breed the black back into the family. She said, your grandfather is my tall, dark, and handsome. She said, I thought you were going to be built like your blacker grandmother. Stocky, chunky, not willowy thin, you know, with no breasts, with no culo, with no hips. She said, you look like your father. I'm like, my, I have the roth. My, my mother is a Leighton. I have the roth nose, right? I have the Jackson 5 nostrils nose. I have the lips. I have the hips. I got that from my father. Next slide. One drop blackness. Caroline Randall Williams shares, according to the rule of hypo descent, the social and legal practice of assigning a genetically mixed race person to the race with less social power. I am the daughter of two black people, the granddaughter of four black people, the great granddaughter of eight black people. Go back one more generation and it gets less straightforward and more sinister. As far as family history has always told, and as modern DNA testing has allowed me to confirm, I am the descendant of black women who were domestic servants and white men who raped their help. So this is an image of my mother, my father, my older sister, Phoebe, who took more after my mother's side of the family. Uh, Willie as a young baby, who's now <laughs> a huge, six six uh, man and that's me and even here so i was born at the very end of 1968 and we're tall we're big boned to people so i was probably two here i'm trying to you know i'm trying to kind of because by the time i was nine i was already five foot three inches tall i was as tall as my teacher in the fourth grade and weighed as much of my teach as much as my teacher in the fourth grade and that's a direct legacy from slavery direct legacy and even at this time, what I appreciate about my mother is you can see that, we, so this is probably 1972. Willie was born in 72. Where did she find this chocolate baby doll? I was like, where, how, where did mama find that? I'm telling you, the resilience in where there's a will, there's a way. So even then she was, she very intentionally, I mean, obviously she and my father were compatible in a variety of ways. And there are people on, on my maternal line who are white passing. You know, I have a, I mean, this is the trauma of it and it's so intimate. And I have a cousin who moved to France and what, cause she didn't want to be outed by those of us, right? On who would out her as her black family. And to this day, uh, I have nephews who I would not recognize if I cross them in the street. And they are French and I believe German or, or Spanish speaking, but they do not speak English, which I think is very interesting. And they're now in their 20s and I don't know them and I will probably never know them. Next slide, please. It is an extraordinary truth of my life that I am biologically more than half white. And yet I have no white people in my genealogy in living memory, no voluntary whiteness. I am more than half white and none of it was consensual. White Southern men, my ancestors, took what they wanted from women they did not love over whom they had extraordinary power and then failed to claim their children. So I wanna to speak to this in particular with how part of what I know in my family in terms of our genealogy, it has to do with 
actual genealogical records. And it also has to do with the stories that have been passed down orally from generation to generation. So I remember very clearly, I'm literally, I'm there. I can see myself in our home. I grew up in Arkansas, in the Mississippi Delta. So I grew up in the northernmost part of the Mississippi Delta, very close to Mississippi, very close to Louisiana. And so, um, yeah, I was confronted uh, with, my parents didn't like white liberals because they said, I want them to just call me nigger to my face. And so that's where I grew up. So that's right. My formative years were spent with those kinds of experiences. And I remember one day when my sister and I were in the kitchen with our mother. And, you know, I remember over the years, one of the first earliest memories I have of my mother is her going into the patio in our backyard. Because in Arkansas, in the country, you can get a house and you can get a nice plot of land for not too much money. And one of the very earliest memories I have of my mother is going outside to see what she was doing. She had on a bathing suit. She was in like on a towel. And I don't know for y'all in the seventies, I'm an old head, I'm old school. So I don't know if you remember that Soleil, like this French tanning lotion, but it was more like Crisco for humans because you put it on and you would fry, like you just literally looked like the person was frying. And my mother had some of that because I remember looking at it and she was outside just slathered like, like she looked like she was a pork chop that you were about to put in the skillet. And I was like, what is she doing? And I go to say something to her and I must have been no more than seven or eight. And I remember her turning around because she was on her stomach. And she had her straps pulled down. And all of a sudden, she just, I saw her face and it was just full of freckles. And I was like, oh, I mean, we lived in an all black neighborhood. It was hyper segregated. Where I grew up has never been not segregated. And I just thought, oh, that's so ugly. I didn't see anybody else around me with freckles like that. And I realized over the course of the years, as I got older, she would share, you know, her thoughts. And I remember one time she was like, you know, when I look in the mirror, I see rape. I was like, what does that mean? Now, of course, I understand what that means. And I understand that she was trying to darken herself because her she was a Confederate monument. She was a Confederate monument. And her skin color was a direct legacy of that. And then later on, you know, we were, when we were in the kitchen and she finally told my sister and I, I was in high school, I was a lot older. And she said, look, this is before DNA testing, which I won't even talk about the results she got when she first did a DNA test. Uh, they were not accurate. Um, and she said, look, I'm more than 50% white and you are probably half white. I was like, okay, but you're black, right? Your grandma's black, grandpa, right? This is being a Confederate monument. This is being a living, breathing, right? Confederate monument. And then one of the gifts that my mother gave me a different conversation, a different time when I was older. And I did it again, I wasn't that much older, so I still didn't fully get it. And I fully get it and I fully embrace it now. And she said, I am so glad that I was born a black woman. I wouldn't want to be anything else. I fully understand it now. Uh, next slide, please. And so what I was able to experience in my family, you know, growing up in the Mississippi Delta in Arkansas was this range, right, of the, see what the Virginia State Assembly, General Assembly, in, 1990, in 1924, passed the one drop rule and legally codified into law if someone is 132nd of African descent, then they are they're classified as black. 
treating Blackness as a stain, treating African descent as a virus that has to be quarantined. And what we did, what Black people all over the globe have always done, we flipped that script. And it created this beautiful tapestry of all of the hues and the rainbow rays of Blackness. And our Black is beautiful. And this is the literally my family, my father, Clifton George Rove, and my mother in the middle, when my father, who was a first-generation college student who grew up as a sharecropper in the fields, descended from slaves, who went to Jim Crow segregated schools, and who ended up earning a DDS, a doctorate in dentistry. So I grew up hearing Dr. Rowe because there were so many doctors in my family on my father's side, right? On the black, on the black, black side. And so it's as like in the power of that, like I was fully acclimated to Dr. Rowe from the time that I was in my single digits. And then my mother, who after having my sister Phoebe that we can see uh, with the picture of my Aunt Mary in the red, uh, me, I'm the next oldest, Willie, who's a year and a half younger than me, and then Andrew, who you can see with my Aunt Mary, who I'm named after, with her hand on his shoulder, they're color coordinated. And then over to the far right, you can see Andrew in front of our father. And Andrew Malcolm Rofe, whom my mother adopted. And when she went to the Department of Human Services, she tells this story. She would tell this story so defiantly. She went and was like, I want to adopt. And I want to adopt a son. And to even out, right, two girls, two boys. And they went and they brought back what she called some mixed looking baby. I was like, oh, okay, mom. well, okay, mama. She wasn't aware of the nuances of colorism. I am. I am now. Um, and she said, take this baby back. I want a black baby. So then <laughs> they went and they found the darkest baby they could find. And when I tell you, Andrew, he looked like a cherub. He looked like an angel. Now, he's not an angel, but so that's how Andrew came to be my brother. And my mother named him after her. Her first name is Andre with two E's. And then she, his middle name is Malcolm. So she named him after herself, and she named him after Malcolm X. And what's really interesting is Andrew looks like one of my cousins on my father's side. So we completely inverted, right? The intent and the oppressive nature of that one drop rule of hypo descent that was passed by the Virginia State Assembly in 1924. And it created a collective and it created a family and it created a power that no force on this planet can stop. Next slide, please. You cannot dismiss me as someone who doesn't understand. You cannot say it wasn't my family members who fought and died. My blackness does not put me on the other side of anything. It puts me squarely at the heart of the debate. I don't just come from the South. I come from Confederates. I've got rebel gray blue blood coursing my veins. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Excuse me. Uh, this is a hard one for me. I am a Black Southern woman. And of my immediate white male ancestors, all of them were rapists. 
My very existence is a relic of slavery and Jim Crow. And this is what my mother meant when she said, when I look in the mirror, I see rape. Grandma Rose, my paternal grandmother. My ancestors fled Alabama to Louisiana after one of my enslaved black women ancestors was raped by a then plantation owner who later on ran for office and was elected governor of Alabama. Rapist. My grandfather on my father's side, Grandpa Rove, Doc. My ancestors on his side were enslaved and came through South Carolina. And what I've come to learn about Doc's last name, which English professors, linguists who are knowledgeable with indigenous European languages such as Gaelic, where does your name come from? Is it Gaelic? It sounds Gaelic. Is it German? Is it British? And one time my mother and I were together when they asked and I said, I don't know. But the deeper truth is it came from the slave owner of my grandfather and his ancestors in South Carolina. Grandma Layton, my mother's mother. Again, these are stories that have been passed down from generation to generation. And I pieced them together like pieces of a quilt. Free black woman ancestor on my grandmother's side. And I remember the story like it's yesterday, Grandma Layton sharing this with me. And Grandma Layton was really interesting because it was when I had that one-on-one -on -one time with her when she would just share these gems. She would share these nuggets. And these are heirlooms, right? I consider these the most precious heirlooms when it comes to my family heritage. And she shared with me how one of her relatives was outside and there was a returning soldier from the Civil War. And her black woman, you know, that black woman ancestor was raped. We don't know whether he was returning from the South to go back to the North because he fought on the Union side, or whether he was a Confederate soldier who was returning back home to Virginia because my maternal grandmother, Grandma Layton, and Grandpa Layton, both born in Virginia. My Virginia roots run deep. They run so deep that my enslaved African ancestors actually formed unions and families with the Pamunkey, who were the largest member of the Powhatan Confederation that took on the original English colonizer in Jamestown. And also what I have come to recognize is that because of my Virginia roots, my grandmother and her mother and her mother's mother were surveilled and policed heavily when it came to quarantining the stain of African blood, right? They were right in the heart of not only the originator of the one drop rule, but also the capital of the Confederacy. Grandpa Layton grew up in Richmond, which is the, was the capital of the Confederacy. Grandpa Layton is the only member of my uh, kind of recent ancestors who was, whose ancestors were never enslaved, which is really interesting because Grandpa Layton is the one member in my lineage where the whiteness was integrated through marriage. And so the we're descendant from the signer of the Decla of Declaration of Independence 
and a president of the U.S. who's known because he was only in office for one day and he became ill and he died. And it's the Harrisons. And uh, William Harrison and Benjamin Harrison, I believe. And actually the marriage was on the part of a black uh, African-American ancestor on my grandfather's side who married the sister of these two brothers. There's a connection there. Free blacks who were not enslaved and consensual, right, between a black man and a white woman. But when it comes came to the part of both grandmothers, as I sa have said, uh, I have rape on both sides of my family tree. Next slide, please. Either way, I say the monuments of stone and metal, the monuments of cloth and wood, all the man-made monuments must come down. I defy any sentimental southerner to defend our ancestors to me. I am quite literally made of the reasons to strip them of their laurels. Black lives matter. Truth matters. Healing matters. Reconciliation matters. And for whoever does not choose to walk this path voluntarily, well, we're going to walk over them. Next slide, please. So what I would like to do now before uh, we transition into question and answers, a question, a, a com the conversation, right? Open this up to the conversation because I'm just introducing the um, foundation and the framework for this larger conversation. I'm really looking forward to your questions and your insights and to hear more about your stories. And I also invite you to share your testimony. How is your body a Confederate slash colonizer slash conquistador monument? Thank you, Kara. The legacy of our skin is both pain and it is power. And we tap into the power of our ancestors dating back since time immemorial when we open up to this deeper truth because this is the deeper truth. I'm uh, asking Ms. Bernadine if she will join us as well so we can engage with that question because it's such a powerful one. Um, and for our audience, if you're uh, tuned in and watching along with us live, we definitely invite you to share your um, your monument story in the comments so we can all engage together. Uh, and I think I answered it, answered this question um, at the beginning when I talked about um, my, my birthplace and, and, and my people, my ancestors. Um, Cape Verdeans are the product of Senegalese people, West Africa, and the Portuguese. And it is very interesting um, to see Senegalese people in Senegal um, with this beautiful dark skin. And then you go 200 miles west of, of Senegal and you're in Cabo Verde, those nine small islands, and you see these varying shades of beautiful people. Um, but it, it, it's almost scary um, I've encountered, and, and so in Boston, Massachusetts, which is the largest Cape Verdean community in the States, and so it's, 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 it's very startling 
you see this beautiful dark skin and if their back is turned and then they turn towards you and these glaring ice blue eyes are staring back at you. Um, and, and, and it's all a testament of, and, and as I describe it, bef even before getting to the South, that uh, this sin um, uh, happened, you know, even before these people arrived um, in America. Um, and so, and I, this, this evening, and I, I want to thank you, um, Sister Doctor, um, because this is a deeply, this is a deeply personal presentation. Um, to <laughs> live every day um, knowing the truth of, of the skin that we're in and having to wear it. We don't get to strip ourselves of it. You know, you don't get to wake up to tomorrow and say, I don't feel like dealing with that. This, this is who we are every day. And, um, you know, I, I, I've said it a few times on, on this broadcast. Um, I'm, we are an amazing people. You know, we do this um, broadcast to enlighten and to inform and to educate. And um, the others, our European American brothers and sisters really have no idea um, what this lived Black experience, um, what it entails. It's, you know, we just harp on, oh, you know, they, these people were brought on a ship and their rights were taken and their names were changed, but it's so much, it's so much deeper than that. Um, and, and so that is why we do this broadcast, but this is personal. And, and I think, I, I thank you, I love you too. And you know that um, to share, and I knew a, you've shared it a few times, your story, your mother's story and, and that wedding story. And I definitely um, identify with that because um, I look at my son, who I call my chocolate drop, and um, I have to admit, um, you know, I, people fall in love or are attracted to people for whatever reasons, but um, I grew up knowing that I wanted to be involved with a very dark skinned man, that I wanted a dark child. Um, and that was a part of, of the defiance that I think that, that, that we're talking about this evening. So, um, that's it. That's all I have. Where are you with it, Sister Kara? You know, I was commenting while you were speaking, Dr. Rofe, about how powerful and unexpectedly powerful this presentation was. As I think of um, my own family's history, it was interesting to me that our families come from similar areas. My paternal grandmother's family was from South Carolina. My paternal grandfather's family was from Virginia. Um, my mother's side of the family is all up and down the East Coast um, and actually lived in Philadelphia. So we're very connected to the Temple area. Um, but uh, I, I shared with uh, the other uh, facilitators for these conversations, a, a picture of my mother and father uh, when I was a baby. 
And my mother was a very uh, light-skinned black woman to the point that I can remember being in first or second grade and having her come to pick me up from school and having the kids say, like, are you adopted? (laughs) Um, And I think she looked very clearly like me. Um, But yeah, just having that that legacy. And I can remember different points, her uh, discomfort in talking about it. You know, I would ask her why we looked so different, why, how she was so light and I was so dark. Um, And it was a a blending of, well, it doesn't matter, or don't just don't ask that kind of question (laughs) because it doesn't matter in her perception. Um, I think I've been struck through this conversation and through reading the, the initial essay and listening to your presentation um, with the struggle with that representation of, of the black body as a Confederate monument um, and found myself saying, you know, I, I don't wanna be a Confederate monument. I wanna be a monument to the people who defied that legacy. Um, to the ancestors who made it beyond the Confederate legacy um, and made it beyond that trauma. But I think there's also the power in acknowledging that history and and that uh, part of of all of our history as uh, Black people. It's part of what gives us the strength. So thank you for your presentation and I think now we are prepared <laughs> to launch into our Q&A. Um, are, so you, want, go I, ahead. I was going to go ahead. I was going to launch into this, this deep question um, that, um, that, that has been posted um, in the studio. So, I saw um, that. That's the one I was going to start. Okay, good, good, good. Go ahead, then. <laughs> so the, the question that was uh, shared was, what about bull breaking? Do you think that uh, the Black male mind is ready to have such a talk on the matter as as we all have? Um, and the, the poster said, they seek whiteness, and it's odd given the treatment. So I think, uh, and you know, I, I'm constantly researching, constantly learning. I was that child who harassed my parents by saying, but why, 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 why? And so and always growing and evolving as an educator, because at heart, I am a teacher. And I have been, you know, since I started teaching seventh graders in 1993. And so I started, I came across the research um, and actually had this conversation recently. So first of all, I want to make sure that I am correct in clarifying. Well, I'm going to, so bull breaking. We're very familiar with Caroline Randall Williams' testimony to the systemic rape, right, of, um, at a really massive scale that was perpetrated through colonization, through slavery, and through imperialism, and how women were subjected to this. Um, Black enslaved men were also subjected to this. They were publicly stripped. They were publicly sodomized by Massa in front, right, as an example. And this was consistent and regular. It was a tactic. It was a strategy. And it's so, it's even difficult to come across this in research. I will say that. And the second part of the breaking of Black men is the legacy of slavery as um, that whenever black men tried to protect black women, I mean, this is from when they were kidnapped from whatever the conflicts were, brought to Ghana, brought to the West African coast to go 
to the slave, they were murdered, they were killed. That was it. That was consistently, if you try to protect, right, if you try to manifest and express the most fundamental elements of your manhood, right, of your masculinity, we will kill you. You cannot protect. This is so deeply painful. And I think, and it just, and I think that there's shame around this collectively. It's part of the racial consciousness. It's definitely been passed down as Joy DeGruy calls, you know, calls out um, all of the different impacts of post-traumatic slave syndrome. I don't know how black men can start to access some of that because when I think about, I mean, I think about the divine feminine and the divine masculine. And I think what white supremacy has done is that it's really twisted and warped, right? The feminine and the masculine. And we just see that in a lot of different ways. And so men are taught in this and conditioned. I know that my brothers were, I know that my nephews were, I now have a great nephew. This really toxic kind of way of equating, feeling, staying connected with their heart and with their feelings and with their soul as not being masculine. I'm like, no, actually that is, right? That's a part of the divine masculine. So until we can decolonize our understanding of sacred masculinity and the sacred feminine, and we can reclaim and restore those identities, because like black people, people, we don't fit, like we don't fit whatever the, you know, the white uh, Miss Ann and Mr. Charles, I mean, this I'm, this, I'm going back home. We don't, people talking about Becky and Karen. I'm like, no, I grew up in Miss Ann. Miss Ann is a missus of the plantation and it wasn't Chad. And it wasn't Tom, it was Mr. Charlie. And Mr. Charlie is the master of the plantation. So quite frankly, black people have never had access to those gender norms and I don't want to. Because I go back to a deeper kind of femininity. And I just, I don't know because the, the, I, the shame around even acknowledging that there was this systematic breaking and emasculating of black men. And it hurts me to my core. And we gotta, we gotta, we gotta have some real conversations with our brother. Because I I I, I let, let me tell you something. Because my friend was like, I'm six feet, right? I'm about six feet. I'm literally the size and the height of the average man in the United States. It's different depending on the country. And I know if I were a man. I probably wouldn't even be alive right now in this body if I were a man. If I were a man, I know that I would not be an assistant professor of anything. So it's very important. Again, it's like you share, Kara, it's the pain and the power in facing this truth head on and I just want to say, it's like, oh my God, I just, I, there's so much pain and there's so much shame around that. And I know that it's going to take our brothers, first of all, coming together and having their own space to have a real conversation about this. Because it's still happening. Mm-hmm. Wool breaking never stopped. It's still happening. Uh, you're, you're right. Amen, one hundred percent to to everything that that you're saying. But as as you're saying about who black men having to come together, therein lies a big problem because that is what being enslaved. Uh, that was the master plan to keep us divided. Yes. And, and so it, it, it becomes very difficult. Um, we know that this, this is what needs to happen, but 
when we say when then we get to the end, well, how do we make it happen? And, and one thing that I do want to also add, you know, a part of this pain um, and, and sadness that we have got to overcome is that while the black man was being emasculated, then black women were being programmed to not respect our black men. And so what I would just like to say to that is until we as women respect women, respect ourselves, we cannot expect black men um, to respect us or we can not begin to have this conversation of bringing them together. It, it really begins with us. And, and, um, and then we can come together. So, and you know, and, and here again, it, it goes back to all of this we carry, we live with every day. This has become a part of our DNA. You know, I mean, we may be, we're, we're, we're privileged to have this platform to talk about it this evening. And, you know, we're beginning to be able to come into these spaces and have these conversations. But I know that our ancestors, all three of us here this evening, our ancestors, they were all together too with the same conversation. Yeah. I want to uh, focus in on some of the the particulars of this conversation to the black body and in particular the black female body uh, there's a, a book by an author shirley tate called black women's bodies in the nation and in it she writes that the dominant white perceptions of body size shape and skin color alongside assumption of black women's psyches and productive or reproductive functions were already being imprinted onto their racialized bodies constructed as the binary of the iconic, frail, thin, asexual white femininity. Oppression was both rationalized and justified as white America, the white Caribbean and its metropoles projected what it feared about itself onto black women's bodies. So the question that I have from that is how do you see the stereotyped representations of black women through their bodies as separating our identities from our actual lived experiences? Woo, Kara, that is, oh my goodness. So Bernadine, I'm gonna, and I do believe this always goes back to the source and the source is reclaiming our power within, right? It's decolonizing ourselves, it's healing ourselves so that we uphold ourselves in a particular way, in particular ways, and our sisters in particular ways. And then I'm gonna go back to actually a unit <laughs> that I taught in North at, at Northern Arizona University in anthropology, because I taught about constructions of race and gender and black bodies versus European bodies. And so I did an entire mini unit on Sarah Bartman called Hot and Tot Venus. And this is actually the prototype. And when I think about the projection and the othering and the relegation of the shadow side of whiteness and white femininity as it's projected onto the black female body. And uh, many of you may be familiar with Sarah Bartman's uh, story. She, and, uh, it, right, a direct, and this was actually, this was colonization. I mean, this was, her experience is the most disturbing, one of the most disturbing 
And one of the most heart-rending, right, examples and demonstrations of this kind of divorcing and severing from the way that the Black female body is fetishized and also seen in the context of freakishness and how that's detached from our own lived experiences. And so Sarah Bartman, I believe she was a part of uh, a tribe that was indigenous to South Africa. And I'm not sure if it was a Kung or which, uh, which nation it was. And as a result of colonization, you know, which is what's interesting to me about this experience is, is that I associate the uh, othering and the kind of anti-Blackness, a lot of the embodiment of that is more of a particular West African phenotype, right? The wide nose, the large lips, the well-endowed everything, right? It's like the well-endowed on the part of the women and the men. But in this case with Sarah Bartman, she's actually indigenous to, uh, thank you, the thank you, thank you. It's and I'm not, I appreciate uh, you for entering the actual language of this indigenous nation. And I'm not sure if I pronounce it the Khoi Khoi. And so, as a result of colonization and Europeans, and I mean, that's the first thing you have. When we think about the Dahomey women warriors, right, uh, who were chosen by the king from the time that they were teenagers, and they were chosen based on two characteristics beauty and strength beauty and power. We have never divorced our femininity from our power. I mean, there's power in the sacred feminine. It's the power of life, right? So Sarah Bartman was lured back to France. This is in the mid 19th century, some like the 1840s, 1850s. And she was lured with the promise of fame and fortune and she was literally relegated to a one woman zoo, a one woman circus, because the French colonizers or whoever, I'm assuming it was the French, because that's where she ended up in France. There's actually a documentary in that was made in French. And I watched it when, uh, back, I mean, it's been almost 10 years ago. I found it on YouTube and it's in French and it has subtitles. And I think it's well done. So she was lured back. They were fascinated, repelled, right? Fascinated, repelled by what they considered to be her overly large breasts, her elongated labia, and her butt, and her buttocks. And so especially... Because the binary opposite of that, as I love how you, I mean, yeah, Kira, it's the asexual, it's the sterile uh, constructions of white beauty where it's literally very thin, right? Very frail, physically, spiritually, all of that. So she gets lured back. She's literally put on display day after day after day, naked in a cage, and their French and other Europeans come and they've got their, I mean, they, they, I mean, she's literally an animal in a cage and the people that brought her back were basically, uh, I, pimp is mean, they were her slavers. I mean, we call it human trafficking. Now they were getting all of the money and eventually they stopped making money. And so she then became, then she was literally trafficked, right? Then she was literally she went from being sexually enslaved in one respect to literally going into enforced prostitution. And she uh, suffered miserably. And by the time she was 26, she had passed. She died. And it didn't just end there. So it was then her, her body was taken, I don't know, to French anatomy and medical schools. And she actually, when she was even living, was like was uh, like a living kind of display for some of these in, in this role as well. Because they had just, they were like, they'd never seen a woman's body like hers before. And even after she passed, they preserved her organs, they preserved her body parts, they put them on display. 
And it took the South African government pressuring the French government more than 150 years later to demand that they return Sarah Bartman's remains back to her homeland. And I believe this was in 2004. And I will tell you what I did in this class because with anthropology, and so I was always bringing in the critical content into all of my classes, not just the ethnic studies classes. And so what I, two, the, one of the key questions was, how much does culture, how much do we change versus how much do we stay the same? So I was like, the students are like, <gasps> I mean, I would have students walking by outside of the class who would stop and who would look. And, and I was like, oh, well, so, you know, do you, do you think we've changed a lot since the mid 19th century, since this absolute, the most vile dehumanization of the black female body, right? Or, or do you think that there's similarities? And so I will say this, the students were like, this is when Nicki Minaj, Anaconda, Anaconda came out. And I'm like, can you think of anyone? Like I asked these open-ended questions. Can you think of anyone in today's society, pop culture, model, actress, athlete? And I'm not saying it to bash Nicki Minaj. I'm saying let's put it in the larger context. And they were like, Nicki Minaj? I was like, well, let's see. Because I showed them images. And then I played part of the Anaconda video. I was like, so what are the similarities and what are the differences? And it opened up to a very heated discussion where I remember there was one young black woman in particular who was like, well, Nicki Minaj is a feminist. This is, this is empowerment because she doesn't have traffickers. She doesn't have a pimp. Right. She doesn't. She's making money off of this. She's in control of her own image. So when it's self chosen, then it's empowerment. I was like, OK, so do you see any other differences or similarities? So we went and then I started talking about when we talk about constructions of gender, we have to talk about the intersection of race and gender. And not only when it comes to black women bodies, are we objectified? Are we fetishized? Are we rendered into circus freaks? But it's literally, we're so dehumanized that there are particular parts of our bodies. We're not even a whole body, right? The black male body isn't even a whole body. It's the breasts, it's the hips, it's the butt. I learned from my students, are we gonna keep it real? My students are the one that introduced me to BBC. I didn't know what the BBC was, and I'm not talking about the British Broadcasting Company either. So with the Black man, the Black man is further broken, broken down into parts. We're not even a whole. And so how have we internalized this hypersexualization, this hyperfetitization, this hyperobjectification and dehumanization, dehumanization where we have been systematically divested from our intrinsic wholeness. To be connected to our sacredness is to reclaim our wholeness. And I'm not gonna bash, right? I'm just asking the question. I know I'm, old, I'm old school, right? I'm an old head. But I'm not going to just start bashing anyone without saying, put it in the larger framework. And then how do we, well, it's easy for me. I don't follow Instagram. I don't do all, like, it's the young people, like, you know. Can, can I put something out there also to, to talk about um, when we talk about Sister Sarah? Um, no one likes us. Um, <laughs> um, the they seem to, to have a problem with our blackness. 
Um, they say we were cursed because of the color of our skin. Um, and then, <clears throat> you know, they, they've studied us, they've torn us to pieces. But yet during this time of Sister Sarah being pimped, I, I just like to keep it real, um, throughout Europe, we see, uh, for all my fashionistas out here, and um, that the, the, the French women and the English women now begin to wear a bustle, <laughs> which resembles my hot and tot, because I have a hot and tot. Um, so, so now you don't like us and I'm, I'm because I, I need you to help me with this, Sister Mary. You don't like us. You have a problem with us. You've torn us all to pieces. You've castrated our men. Um, you know, you've, you know, you've seen our breast, our, our, sa our most sacred parts, and then our hot and tots. <laughs> Um, and so now you're going to emulate this, um, even so far as, I mean, some of these dresses had wire in it to make it stand, <laughs> to make it stiff. And, and it looked like Sister Sarah. So I, I, I really, I, I thank you for being here this evening because um, help me with this. Help, help me with this. Okay, I had to unmute myself. Okay, so I I see you in the comments. Take us to church, Bernadine. Take us to church. I'm going to tell you what Joy DeGrid, she's not the first one. It's called cognitive dissonance. Translation, they are schizophrenic. They are, you know, I was, I said, white supremacy is, the price is divesting yourself from your full, from your whole humanity, you become a monster. And the other price is, it's literally, you lose your mind. I mean, it's, it just, so I teach uh, in one of my ethnic studies classes and I teach a particular, a more recent scholar who we look at settler colonialism, which is a kind of colonialism that was imposed in the United States. And it's a really, I mean, they're all equally pernicious and everything else. I think, I personally think colonization is the worst thing that has ever happened to humankind ever. I don't think that there's anything. I mean, and I, I'm a, I'm a stu stu student of history too. And so it's settler colonialism as framework. And what I love about this, now, these students are juniors and seniors, and this is not until the latter part of the semester, because this author breaks down the sexual politics of colonization and white supremacy and anti-Blackness. And there was always this tension of this fascination. And it's, again, it's this fascination, but then it's also this repulsion because white supremacy is based on dehumanizing everybody else. So how could we be fascinated? How could you not be? These are the original baby. We evolved out of sub-Saharan Africa. Human, all of humankind evolved out of the East African savanna, which I have the tremendous honor of visiting and staying with the Maasai in Masai Mara, right in Kenya, uh, back in many years ago, 2004. So let's let's get into this. Let's talk about attraction repulsion because we literally not only do you have this phenomena called black fishing that's all over social media where it's no longer black face, even though that stems from the same constant conflict of fascination, repulsion, attraction, fear, all of the 
So we go from minstrelsy and we go from blackface to this complete caricature, I mean, just overt um, othering in these really obviously blatantly derogatory ways of Black people, the anti-Blackness. And now in 2021, we're in full-blown Black fishing where all kinds of women, it's women on social media from Europe and from all four corners of the globe are taking on the aesthetic of Black women. And we see this with the Kardashians who built their whole empire off of getting surgeries, right, to mimic Sister Sarah. And I want to take it back to Louisiana, which <laughs> colonized by the Spanish, by the French, Italy was up in there. Louisiana, or Louisiana, church that I've done where the, the laws where that were white women, you know where I'm going with this, pressured white men to pass laws that mandated that women of African descent had to cover their hair. And I mean, literally, when you go and you look at the text, it's like it's too distracting. And the white men were fascinating. I mean, you talk about all these different women from all these different lineages from the motherland rocking all the every. The, I said, oh, no, you got to cover that up. You got you got to cover that up. You got to cover that up. And where we know to I'm in California, I'm in a state that in 2020 had to pass what's called the Crown Act to specifically call out and make it illegal to discriminate against African descent people from wearing the hair as it grows out of our scalp in the workplace. This is not, and but then there's this bizarre, like, like the mainstream society loves the black culture, loves the black aesthetic, loves the black hair, loves the black lips, loves the black culo on non-black bodies. On non-black bodies. It's part of the cognitive dissonance of white supremacy. It's part of the cognitive dissonance of colonization. And make it make sense. I because at some level we all know, right? We we all know the truth. On some level, people have been recognizing the beauty and the power of Black women in particular. And I will tell you, with Bell Hooks, it's a quote, and I would, and I, Bell Hooks, when she speaks to it, people seek to destroy us, not because they hate us in terms of not because we're inferior, right? I'm paraphrasing. They seek to destroy us because of our power. That's why they seek to destroy us. That's as close as I can come. I would love to hear from other folks, but it it, it is the most, it is such cognitive dissonance. And the people who, and the anti-Blackness of it all, you want all the culture, you want all the food, you want all the music, you want all the inventions, you want all the genius, you want all the swag, but you don't want it in a Black body. That's anti-Blackness. And that's misogyny noir. That's a hatred of Black women, specifically. That's misogyny noir. Thank you, Kira. That's it. That's it. We. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I'll I'll let you go because I'm moving on to a question. But if you want to add on to that, no, we go ahead. We can move on. Okay. Uh, so it's interesting to me. Uh, I talked a little bit when we were talking about uh, our own, you know, legacies and our own standing as as monuments. Um, one of the things that was interesting to me in the essay was that uh, in paralleling traditional 
Confederate monuments with the Confederate monument of the black body and especially the black woman's body. Uh, Williams really seems to be simultaneously recognizing the oppressive images the traditional Confederate monuments represent and the forms and systems of oppression often placed upon black women in America. So do you see that same parallel and why do you think such an intersection of the inanimate in those statues and the animate in the black woman's body is important? That is a beautiful question. So, this is what is coming to me. And for me, and I don't say this as, I mean, I know that these words are so overused. God is not male to me. God is not female. God transcends that. To me, God, God is the I am, the all that is. Ever since I was a young child, I have always resonated intuitively with indigenous African and indigenous, na indigenous, indigenous Native American and even pre-Christian European, right? Like our religions, um, our beliefs, our practices, our rituals. And so I also, when I think of God, and I know people, God is synonymous with love. Truth is synonymous with love. Liberation is synonymous with love. And when I think of these, what I think when I read Williams' essay, what I saw her is she's specifically engaging with really what is a master narrative, right? It's a master narrative of the old South, of the Confederacy, of the, the, the Civil War. It's this master narrative, right? Which is we know it's not only, it's lies by omission and it's lies by commission. And she specifically, I'm like, she's like, I'm at the heart of this debate, right? We're at the heart of this debate. The deeper truth that transcends this inanimate, this rigid, this frozen, this lifeless narrative. We, I am literally the breathing, living truth because that is what truth is. And she's, because really she could have completely... I'm not going to engage this right or center this at all. But she's like, wait a minute, I'm at the heart of it. And I'm going to get to, a, I'm going to transcend this death. White supremacy is an ideology of death. Lies, right, are synonymous with death. These are, ne these are nihilistic forces. And if we don't get it together, it's we're we're about to completely evict ourselves off of the planet, the two leggeds. Now I'm calling it we're two leggeds. Um, so when I think of her juxtaposition of censuring herself, censuring her literal flesh and blood, it's the truth. It's the living truth, and this is God, and this is the only way to once and for all say enough and we are we're we're burning up all these master narratives and it's lies it's lies that are just as lifeless and just as inanimate and just as distorted and skewed as these statues are and it's partial right it's not the complete truth we're going to take it and we're going to make all of this whole by facing it head on and speaking truth, speaking life into it. Not, that's how I see it. So sister doctor, with that being said, the, the monument would literally tearing down all of these Confederate monuments, will that abolish this, this lie? that we've been talking about this Absolutely. evening? No, it's one step. It's like land acknowledgement. I mean, our university actually, the president of our university here, it is Estanislao, right? It's, it's um, 
this weird Polish transliteration of this yoke of warrior. He was a warrior. And our mascot is warrior, but it looks like this weird Pillsbury Doughboy meets like a Spartan. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're warriors. We're Stanislaw, right? We're warriors. That's our legacy of warriors. When I say I've been summoning the students, I've been like rise up warriors, the real warriors, not this whatever they got over there. But this is what I will say for the president of our university, for example. And, and I, I'm on Senate, in academic Senate. It's uh, anyway. So, um, so it's through Senate that these kind of policies get passed. This is all of the structures and all of the um, all of the different white supremacists, colonial, all the stuff, and it got passed. So yes, we passed a land acknowledgement policy on our campus. And it is a totally empty token gesture if we don't go beyond that to actual action. We're on Yokut land. We're on, there's all, there's all kinds of, they're called missions in California. Like we need to actually start recruiting and retaining Native students to our campus. Like, and, you know, there was a lot of people, for example, who migrated from Oklahoma in the 1920s and 30s after the Dust Bowl because we were wreaking havoc on our home, on the environment and on the land. And right. And so there's like 10,000 Ch Choctaw from Choctaw Nation. So it's like, no, this is one step in and of itself. It absolutely is, is not going to change. And I think it's an important step and it's a beginning. So the final question I, I want to ask for tonight is what does it mean to strip them of their laurels? Uh, that's one of the closing statements that she makes. So what does it mean to strip them of their laurels when it comes to acknowledging the story of our skin along with the legacy of so-called white supremacy? Tell the truth. It's like I tell my students, uh, and this is why there's so much resistance against ethnic studies, which ushers in black studies. It's why there are all of these attempts to not only sanitize, but to completely erase what little bit of information we have in K through 12 textbooks. Um, I show my students, I mean, I know I work with young adults. It's when I tell my students, I'm like, in order to impose this kind of a system for nearly a quarter of a millennium, it's literally indescribable. The systematic brutalization, the systematic terror. The, uh, it's You could take, because I used to love horror movies. Oh, I wonder why I had a morbid sense of fascination when I was a young child. And I'm like, you could take the most graphic, macabre, blood curdling, let's say 10 horror movies. And you could put them all together and you would not be able to touch upon the abject depravity and evil that became normalized during slavery throughout the diaspora, right? I mean, we talk about Brazil, we talk about colonization turned the Caribbean into plantations. It just turned the whole Caribbean into plantations, the whole thing. And I, and I, it's, it's, there's nothing. And so I, I show, right. We describe to a certain degree and we've got to tell the truth about just, it's, it's, it's beyond like it's, it's, I was watching Toni Morrison a couple of nights ago, and it's, oh my God, talk about a sister. You talk about an ancestor. And she is like, she's, she's like, I'm amazed that we're even still alive. And I will tell you right now, it's why I believe in God. It's not because of the Bible. I don't have anything against the Bible, but you know, talking about person, Cam, I grew up in the Southern Baptist church. I grew up in, right in the Bible Belt in the Deep South. And I draw from that as, right? And I believe in God because we are here right now. That's why I believe in God. 
we got to tell the truth about it. We've got to tell the truth. And I'm telling the truth is not being told. We've got to do a truth and recon- our version of truth and reconciliation. We got to talk about reparations for real, for real. You need to pay us. You need to, you can never, can never. I mean, when we talk, we got to be very mindful of this is indigenous land. And then what does it look? Because we can't, there is, there is no paying back. There is no compensating for colonization and genocide and slavery. And there's things that we can do that are not even, no, no, like this is boo boo. If you really, you couldn't, it's impossible for you to pay us, right? It's impossible for you to compensate us for what is due. I mean, then everybody, well, first of all, when people start talking about illegal immigration, I'm like, oh no, everybody leave right now. Only the Native Americans, and not just the, the Native folks who were recognized by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Department of Interior, federal. No, not the ones who are federally recognized. Because right, it's like er, then everybody go. I'll go too. Everybody leave. You concerned about illegal immigration? Bye. Get out. We got to start telling the truth. I mean, it's we've got to start telling the truth about what it really was and what it really entailed. I, I, you know, people want to talk about, I was like, for all the folks calling yourselves Christians, you white supremacists, you put laurels at those men's feet? You got to start telling the truth. Well, as we wrap up um we can hide my screen for one second actually i'm going to close out with a um first of all thank you dr rofe that was amazing and engaging and touching and overwhelming in so many ways a presentation Um, it was deeply personal it's telling the story of our bodies and uh, our stature um, I, I compare, um, at the very least, the statue to the status and the stature of Black women in this country and the amount of strength that we have managed to maintain and, and the amount of pain that we have managed to endure and still be here. Um, I want to end with reading a really short portion of a poem by uh, poet Mary Evans, Um, who passed away at the age of 97 in 2017, uh, but wrote a beautiful poem called I Am a Black Woman. And she ends that poem by writing, I am a black woman, tall as a cypress, strong, beyond all definition still, defying place and time and circumstance, assailed, impervious, indestructible, look, on me and be renewed. So now I will share uh, my screen just to close us out with uh, our typical, our our every session reminders of what's coming up next for the Lived Black Experience. Our next session will be on Wednesday, April 7th at 6 p.m and it will be on the subject of Black Trans Lives Matter. We will hear the experience or the lived experience of a Black trans woman, the lived experience of a Black trans man, and we'll talk about why Black trans lives matter and how we get to that reality. And of course, we will have our question and answer period, so we invite you all to join us uh, on Wednesday, April 7th at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. The Live Black Experience is dedicated to fully engaging the community in all aspects of the lived Black experience and facilitating community dialogues regarding it that lead to mutual understanding, respect, and reconciliation. We are housed in the historic Murdoch Community Center, which is located on the site of the old Dunbar Elementary School. Dunbar was desegregated almost two years prior to Brown versus the Board of Education, and the school system here was held up by the NAACP nationally as a model for education. By taking a few minutes to complete the survey linked below, 
you are helping us to continue to provide the community with relevant and timely programming. As always, if you enjoy the programming brought to you by the Murdoch Community Center, we ask you to consider helping us continue the work with a monetary donation. You may do so by going to the link below or scanning the QR code on this slide. And again, just to close us out, we want to thank everyone who joined us this evening, those who live streamed with us, those who will go back and watch this later, uh, those who will share this out into their broader community, those internationally who will watch this um, and share it with their peers. Um, and we hope that everyone who is watching will take the lessons from this uh, Live Black Experience session and share them out and embrace them as we strive to tell the truth and bring that truth into greater knowledge within our community. Uh, we thank you as always for supporting this work and for engaging with us. We look forward to seeing you join us again next time. And until then, we wish you a blessed evening. <laughs>